On Overdrive today, we drive the all-new Tata Punch EV. Go track riding in the new track monster, the Aprilia RS457 and take a ride astride the Java 350 in Gujarat. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I am Soini. The Tata EV's very first active architecture-based product is here in the market. The Punch EV promises a driving range of 421 kilometers, has plenty of trims on offer with interesting creature comforts. So does it impress us as much as the Nexon EV? Let's find out. We know most of the stuff about this uh, Tata Punch EV. For example, the prices, uh, the battery pack, the official or claimed range. We know what kind of trim levels or personas are we looking at. We also know that this car is based on active architecture platform. This is the first Tata electric car which is based on that platform. But what we don't know, how it drives and uh, what kind of real life uh, range are we looking at and how comfortable it is. So let's uh, talk about those elements which uh, separate uh, Tata Punch EV from uh, the Punch Ice version and uh, one obviously looks department and then you have uh, more features in this car and the new active platform. Punch EV now adopts a face similar to its older sibling LED DRLs with welcome and goodbye sequences, smart charging indicators and LED projector headlamps with cornering fog lamps mimic the Nexon EV's design. The exterior otherwise remains familiar with a new alloy wheel design and punch dot EV badging on the back marking the difference. Not to forget the 14 litre frunk and added convenience. Inside the punch EV undergoes a significant transformation. The dashboard receives a complete redesign featuring the Nexon's illuminated steering wheel, a larger 10.25 inch infotainment screen takes center stage with a 10 inch digital cockpit offering multiple views or layouts. The Punch EV comes with six airbags, ESP and ISOFIX child seat mounts as standard. Additional features like SOS call function, rear parking sensors and a 360 degree camera with blind spot monitoring are available on the higher trims of personas. The camera quality could be better to match the premium theme of the higher trims. Hill hold and descent control along with an electronic parking brake with auto hold for extra convenience and safety. Top variants boast disc brakes on all four wheels for optimal stopping power. So this story has two parts. One being the product itself and then the platform it stands on. Punch EV is the first product from Tata Passenger's electric mobility based on the active platform which claims 10% better energy density and boasts several capabilities and modularity. The battery pack design offers multiple range options up to 600 km. The same platform can be used to accommodate all-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive and front-wheel drive options and can also support 7.2 kW to 11 kW onboard chargers for AC and DC fast charging. Tata Electric claims that the user will get a 100 km range with just 10 minutes of charging. Acti.ev can also support multiple body styles, capable of meeting future crash test standards and is ADAS level 2 ready. While developing uh, this active architecture platform, Tata Motors was clear that they didn't want to compromise on the ground clearance of the Tata Bunch or uh, the cabin space, uh, even with the batteries uh, you know, fitted inside. That is the reason we still have 190 mm of ground clearance. And just to showcase that uh, capability, they have also organized one off-roading session with the Tata Punch EV. Punch EV gets two versions, the standard and a long range. The standard version starts at Rs 10.99 lakh for the Smart Persona and the top end is called Empowered Plus Persona which is for Rs 13.29 lakh. This version is fitted with a 25 kilowatt hour battery pack where the motor produces 80.4 bhp of power and 140 Nm of torque. 
The range is 315 kilometers in one charge and it can go from 0 to 100 in 13.5 seconds. The Punch EV long range is starting at an extra room price of Rs 12.99 lakh and the top end is for Rs 14.49 lakh. This gets a 35 kilowatt hour battery and a range of 421 kilometers. The power output is 121 bhp and torque of 190 newton meters. 0 to 100 in 9.5 seconds. The standard version will take 9.5 hours to charge at home via an AC home wall box charger and 13.5 hours for the long range version. In case you want to pay Rs 50,000 extra, you get a 7.2 kilowatt AC home wall box charger which will charge the Punch EV in 3.6 hours and Punch EV long range in 5 hours. In case you want to charge it on the go, 9.4 hours and 13.5 hours for these two versions from a regular 15 ampere plug point. And if you find a DC charger, Punch EV can be charged from 10 to 80% in 56 minutes. Now comes that part where uh, EVs outshine their uh, ICE counterparts, well mostly and in this case definitely Punch EV is really punchy. The acceleration is uh, smooth, linear but exciting. Overall uh, instantaneous torque and that grunt makes it a very fun car to drive. The weight is also something which works in its favor where uh, depending upon the battery pack you have, this is maybe two to three hundred kg extra uh, and the punch ice version. And overall it feels robust and rigid but not in an uncomfortable way. Suspension balance is something which impressed me a lot. Uh, it felt composed and comfortable in the city driving conditions, very planted on the highways and uh, pretty confident on the corners as well. So on a scale of punch ice to Nexon EV, I think uh, this is a good six or seven. Now for the range, we started the drive with 99% battery showing a projected range of 330 kilometers. After covering approximately 170 kilometers, we finished the drive with 24% charge and an estimated 53 kilometers range remaining, which obviously varies depending on your driving style. Therefore, based on a typical media test drive style driving, the long range version's real world range seems to be around 225 to 26 kilometers, which can surely increase with consistent and controlled drive. The Punch EV ticks most boxes for modern buyers. The interior is an upgrade over the ICE version and the price, though introductory, is competitive. It hits the mark on design, features and range, offering enough for daily and for some of us even weekly commutes. However, there are a few minor chinks. Rear legroom might feel cramped for taller passengers. The drive mode selector could be more responsive and there's no spare tire included. But these are not deal breakers looking at the whole package. So, if you're looking for an affordable EV for your small family or don't have the budget for a Nexon EV, Punch EV hits the sweet spot. It has the potential to repeat the success of its bigger sibling. Leave us a comment on the Overdrive YouTube channel to let us know what you think of the Tata Punch EV. We'll be back very shortly to tell you all about the Java 350 as well as the Aprilia RS 457. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. The Java 350 is now up on engine displacement but down on power. It is also better looking than before. But is it the best 350cc classic style motorcycle in the country today? We sent Chris to Gujarat to find out. The Java Classic or the Java Standard has been around for around 7 years time in India. And the company have taken its own time to come out with the Generation 2 model. And just by the looks of it, all the metal panels, the silhouette of this motorcycle resembles what we had already seen before since 2018. But once you come closer to the motorcycle, well, you will make out all those small fine details and additions that the company have made to this Generation 2 model. Now, there's quite an extensive list of features that Java have carried out with this motorcycle over the older bike. But I'll cut it down to what's actually important for you. The stuff you'll notice about it when you first see it and actually get down to riding this motorcycle. Aesthetically, the fit and finish levels have improved tremendously. The paint quality is much better than before. There's different textured parts, like on the side panels, and lots of additional chrome bits on there now, like the fender badge and stays, the heel guards, 
and then there's even some aluminum foot pegs on there now as well. There's new colors to the Java 350's instrumentation readout along with decals all across the bike, including the new tank and engine badges too. The Java 350 is slightly taller than before, with increased ground clearance and seat height as well, while being slightly tighter on overall width. Now as far as functional bits go, well, the bike gets new front and rear suspension units with increased length for better ride comfort. However, one should notice that the rear shocks, although preload adjustable, aren't gas charged anymore. The biggest change to this bike, however, comes in the form of the 334cc liquid-cooled engine that replaces the older 294cc unit. Yes, it has been borrowed from the Generation 2 Pira. And while the displacement, bore and stroke of this motor remains the same as the older Java model, the cylinder head on this bike is new with updated port flow and heat flow management. And as a result, the rate of compression has reduced. The double cradle frame has been modified to accommodate the new engine, while the swing arm at the rear has increased in length to aid stability. Now you think having a bigger displacement engine in there, well, this motorcycle would have more power and tap to offer. But sadly, that isn't the case with the Java 350 because power has in fact decreased down to around 22.5 PS of mass power. From almost 27 PS that was on tap with the older 300cc model. Now the main reason that Java has done this, well they claim, is because they want to maintain that laid back, calm, sensible ride experience that this motorcycle is supposed to give you. And if you wanted something more proactive in the performance sense, well you always have options like the 42 and the Perak. Now while the new model is down on power, torque on the other hand has gone up by 1 nm. Now prior to the ride, Java personal explained to us that they have improved torque on the 2nd, 3rd and 4th gear ratios and configured the engine to deliver all that power and torque overall in a way that gives this bike a better initial shove. Also, the slip and assist clutch, a very welcome feature on this motorcycle. The Java 350 is a lot more user friendly now with vibrations and audibility of its overall functioning beginning to get intrusive past the indicated 90kph mark. Give it enough time, space and effort and you will see the needle on the speedometer fly past 130 kmph. Now things are slightly better than before in the ride and handling department out here as well. Now the front suspension, well it provides neutral feedback. But it's quite absorbent over rough surfaces, so that makes things acceptable. The rear springs on the other hand, well in their stock setting, well they're a bit too firm for my liking because it can get a bit unsettling when you're carrying even a little bit of pace out on the highway. Now the roads out in Gujarat are mostly flat, but when I did come across some heavily undulated patches, it did take a toll on my spine, and you'll definitely want to slow down a lot to take on bumps in the city. Now the Java 350 feels like a decent classic style motorcycle to get you about your business within the city. But if it's proper long distance touring you're looking at, well you might want to consider some other options out there because, well, first and foremost, this motorcycle there isn't a lot of space you have to work with with regard to any luggage you plan on carrying along on your trip. The roads leaning out of Burj towards the white run are mostly long straights with a couple of sweeping bends in between. And these are the kind of roads that you'll really appreciate on the motorcycle of this sort. Retro cruisers give off that calm, peaceful vibe and there's a method to riding motorcycles like this one. And if you're into that kind of riding, well, there are certain aspects and things about this motorcycle that you'll definitely appreciate. Now, for 2,15,000 rupees, the Java 350 is definitely priced a lot lower than something like the Royal Enfield Classic 350. But for that cost, well, you will say that, yes, the, the Enfield has more in terms of features and performance. But then again, this motorcycle is not meant to be heavy in terms of uh, tech. It looks great. The fit and finish, the build quality has improved tremendously over the first generation model. And that's something that fans of the Java brand and the older standard or classic 300, uh, well, that displacement model, well, once you check this one out, you're definitely going to fall in love with it. From Boj, we move on to Curry Motor Speedway to check out the Aprilia RS 457 around the racetrack. Stay with us for that story after this very short break. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Now, Rohit recently headed to the Curry Motor Speedway to find out whether the Aprilia RS 457 is an out-and-out -out track machine or is it just a motorcycle that likes to please everyone with humble power as well as relaxed ergonomics? 
check out this review. Sounds good, doesn't it? It will also make you go weak in the knees because you see the RS457 is styled to follow the same design direction as the bigger RS models from Aprilia, the 660 and the V4. So design has got you covered. Even the engine has got you covered. It's a parallel twin motor. It's powerful, it's punchy. And all of this you get at a price that won't really break your super sport budget. So I think these bases are definitely covered. But you see, we have seen full-fed machines from other manufacturers as well. And there is now a trend where they look fast, they even go fast. But when it comes to the racetrack, they have those sloppy, relaxed, sport tour ergonomics. Charisma, RR310, Yamaha R3, even the Triumph Daytona 660. Damn you, Triumph. But does this follow the same direction? Or is it a proper track tool? We are here at the Kari Motor Speedway to find out just that. I mean, you saw the way it's attacking corners, right? This is a bike that's made in India. This is rolling on tires that are made in India, meaning you can buy them cheap, meaning that you can come to a track like this, shred them to your heart's content, and still you'll not need to get a personal loan to buy the next set. Believe me, that's a very, very important fact. A certain Lorenzo Salvadori probably heard that and even went around drawing circles and burning rubber. These are the TVS Eurogrip Pro Talk Extreme and they're really impressive. We've tried it before on other motorcycles as well, but here it just works so well. Like for example, there is three levels of traction control that you can choose from or you could completely turn it off. The traction control doesn't seem too intrusive, at least on the track. But we would like to see how it behaves on our dusty roads and in the wet, even with the electronics off. So if you do buy this bike as your first super sport, consider investing in a good track riding training program to make the most of this machine. Compared to some of its rivals that use a cheaper tubular terrace frame, the Aprilia uses an aluminium perimeter frame and that's one of the biggest highlight of how it's able to handle around the corners. Then you have this tank that looks large but under braking or while cornering it provides excellent grip and there is enough room even for taller riders to move around to get that proper body posture. So overall all of this comes together quite nicely to make this an excellent cornering tool. Once you master the braking aspect which we'll come to in a bit you can effortlessly carve a precise line through the corner. The nose dive remains subtle, yet under aggressive braking, the bike may exhibit a slight tendency to squirm. Despite the bike's track prowess, the suspension falls short in a disability, limited to setting only the preload for both the front and the rear. In a sense, navigating swiftly on this motorcycle is a breeze, but there is a notable room for enhancement in the braking department. The engine works its magic even around a tight circuit like the Kari. You can be in third and fourth gears all through these corners and still get an excellent drive out of it. And that's all down to the talky nature of the parallel twin motor. The punch of the engine lies in the mid-range, of course, and it's all really evident after 70 kilometers an hour. And it continues to pull strongly all the way up to 160 kilometers an hour. At least that's the top speed that we saw here on the start finish straight of the Kari uh, before braking for the new C1 for the new layout of the Kari Motor Speedway. But this was in fifth gear. You should be able to easily ride past 170 in sixth gear. The engine definitely shows that promise. And this is before you start playing around with the engine, maybe modifying the gearing and all those kind of things. So the overall performance, both in the mid range and in the top end, is really very strong. While appearing compact, the bike defies its size, striking a balance that offers a touch of that big bike feel without sacrificing agility in cornering. The thoughtfully concealed exhaust pipes evoke a reminiscent charm of the original RC390. Though certain plastics might lack a premium touch, I hope they resist buzzing or rattling over time. And the ergonomically positioned controls enhance the overall experience. The RS truly distinguishes itself with a standout design capable of attracting buyers solely on its aesthetic merits. The chassis is aluminium, but the swing arm isn't. That is made in stainless steel, which means it is heavier, which means that the rear monoshock is going to have to do a lot more work. But nothing to complain about, at least in terms of the ride and the handling. Opting for stainless steel in the swing arm construction 
was a cost-effective choice, much like the brakes or certain plastics. However, it does contribute to added weight in the overall build. I'm 5 feet 8 and getting both my feet flat on the ground is not a problem at all. So seat height is covered. Now, in terms of the absolute weight, yes, if you look at the spec sheet, it isn't the lightest motorcycle around. But honestly, you don't really feel the weight in your wrists or in your knees, etc. Maneuvering this bike is absolutely easy, even in tight spaces or even if you were to just move it on its wheels like the way I'm doing right now. Shouldn't be a problem. So tight parking spots, taking U-turns, riding in congested city environments, shouldn't be a worry at all. It has the best part weight ratio in the class though, and it shows on the track. It makes for a decent sport tourer too, but the pinion isn't going to be comfortable with that aggressive seating posture. Aprilias typically embody a compact size yet outpace their peers in speed. Currently, if I were in the market for this category, this Aprilia would be on the top of my list. However, it's worth noting that servicing and the maintenance costs might lean towards the pricier side compared to the Japanese or Austrian alternatives. So in conclusion, the RS457 is a very good blend of style, power and handling. And though it is pretty focused as a super sport, it still can be a good all-rounder in the hands of a seasoned, committed rider. But at the end of the day, it is not merely targeted at the seasoned riders, it is primarily targeted at the new rider. And from that perspective, I think it's priced quite well. I think it has enough performance to keep the newbie riders happy for longer. I'm pretty impressed with the motorcycle on my time on the track. Now, what remains to be seen is how good or bad is it out on the road. That is something that will happen closer to the deliveries which begin in March 2024. That's all from us on this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through our various social media platforms. You can also write to us on our YouTube channel. We'll see you next week. Until then, drive and ride safe.